The school board meeting will begin in one minute. Please take your seats. Again, the school board meeting will begin in one minute. Good evening and welcome everyone. The April 9th, 2024 meeting of the Marion County School Board is called to order at 5.30 p.m. <clears throat> Mirroring and modeling the way our students begin each day, I ask that we observe a moment of silence at this time. Please join me. Thank you. I'll now ask Board Member Cummings to read our commitment statement. Good evening, Board Member Cummings. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening. We are the Marion County School District Leadership Team. When we come together to work, we are efficient, effective, and productive. Our three most important characteristics are dedicated, transparent, and individually responsible. To work well together, we must demonstrate respect, confront reality, and be accountable. We will always put students first, and we will leave a legacy of success. Thank you, Board Member Cummings. For the courtesy of those listening to the meeting, I'm requesting everyone in the audience to please turn off your electronic devices or put them on vibrate. Later in the meeting, up to 30 minutes will be provided for individuals to address the board on matters concerning the operation of the Marion County School System or the school board only. Presentations to the board are limited to five minutes and are televised. If you wish to address the board regarding a regular agenda item, or matters on which the board customarily takes action, you must first complete a peach colored form located in the lobby. If you wish to address the board regarding a public hearing or a student discipline matter, please complete a lime green form. These forms must be fully completed and received by the board clerk no later than 5.40 p.m. The procedures applicable for each are on a separate sheet. Board clerk, please call the roll. Good Dr. Evening. Allison Campbell, District 1. Here. Lori Conrad, District 2. Here. Mr. Eric Cummings, District 3. Here. Mrs. Nancy Thrower, District 4. Here. Dr. Sarah James, District 5. Here. Student Board Member Victor Nygaard from Lakewood High School. Here. Dr. Diane Gullett, Superintendent. Here. Mr. Jeremy Powers, School Board Attorney. Here. Thank you, Ms. Martinez. Dr. Gullett, good evening. Please introduce the member of your team who will be helping us with tonight's inspiration and pledge. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, great to see you. Thank you, Chair. And, and I'm pleased to bring forward Dr. Danielle Livengood, and she is going to introduce our National Merit Finalist. And I just want to say a few words because I was almost late to start. Um, it, I was interacting with our amazing students that received this prestigious honor. Um, and as a parent of a National Merit Finalist, I can tell you they have a lot of choices. So I know the, the choices are great, um, and I know their families that are here are very proud of them as well. A lot of choices and, and options for their future, and it's very bright. So really, really proud of these students. So Dr. Livengood, I'll let you introduce them. Thank you. 
Good evening, Chair Thrower, board members, and Superintendent Dr. Gullett. I have the privilege of introducing the 2024 National Merit Finalists to you. Each year, 15,000 students in the United States are named as National Merit Finalists. This year, 10 belong to Marion County Public Schools. During October of their junior year, students sit for the PSAT and from those scores, National Merit Scholarship Corporation uses its own selection index to determine which students qualify as commended students and semifinalists. In September, about one third, which is about 16,000 of the 50,000 high scores on the PSAT are notified that they qualified as semifinalists. And then in February, over 15,000 semifinalists are notified that they have advanced to the finalist standing. This month, approximately 7,250 finalists will be selected to receive a merit scholarship award. They are chosen from the finalist group based on their abilities, skills, and accomplishments. Florida students who are awarded the National Merit Scholarship also qualify for the Benequisto Scholarship Program, which is equal to the institutional cost of attendance for an in-state student minus the sum of bright futures and the National Merit Award. Now, I'd like to introduce our finalists as they await their final award. After this introduction, Blake Barnes will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. At, when I call your name, please come up and then stand in the front and face the board members, please. We'll be clapping. Yeah. So Blake Barnes from Forest High School. Camille Duma from Vanguard High School. Gianna Michia from Vanguard High School. Davia Nander from Vanguard High School. <laughs> Ify Olo Runlog Bun from Vanguard High School. <laughs> Gabrielle Rebe from Vanguard High School. <laughs> Rashi Shaquib from Vanguard High School. Akaisian Sivesian from Vanguard High School. And Lamia Zaman from Vanguard High School. And Eric Spiegelman from Westport High School was not able to join us this evening, but I want to at least make sure you knew his name as well. Thank you, and, and after the, the pledge, we'll come down and I'd love to take a picture with all of you. And on behalf of the board, just congratulations for making it this far and for having it so together to be able to do this for yourselves. It's just incredible. And, and I know you're thankful to your families and, and your teachers and, and each other um, for, I'm sure, just supporting each other through all of this. I know it hasn't been easy, and at times it's probably been a grind, but, but you continue to make it happen. So that's very commendable. We're so proud of you. Thank you for representing Marion County Public Schools and your high school so well. So Blake, good to see you. <laughs> Blake joined us on the school board as a student representative recently, as did Miss Divya. So it's good to see them both again. Cool to see it on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, let's go take a picture. Yes, ma'am. Like you get to be in pictures. Yeah. <laughs>
board members, would you mind standing behind us, please? Make sure I can see your faces. That's perfect right there. Absolutely. That's great. There you go, Dr. Gallup. Yeah. Just look in the middle and smile. <laughs> Dr. Gullett, I understand we're recognizing additional <laughs> students this evening. We do. We have additional talented students to recognize tonight. So Dr. Levin Good is going to present our Questbridge, Questbridge Scholarship students. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Questbridge aims to increase the percentage of talented low-income students attending the nation's best universities. Annually, approximately 30,000 talented low-income students are academically qualified to attend the nation's best colleges, but the majority of them don't even apply to one selective college. Well, the National College Match is a college admission and scholarship process through which high achieving, low income students can be admitted early with, four, with full four year scholarships to some of the nation's top colleges and universities. Through the National College Match application, students who have excelled academically despite financial hardship can highlight their unique story and stand out in the college admission process. In the fall, QuestBridge selects top applicants as finalists and students are able to rank up to 15 colleges to be matched. Admitted early with a matched scholarship to the college that appears highest on their list that also wants to match with them. There are other students who are QuestBridge scholars but did not match with an institution. So after the recognition this evening, Esperance from North Marion High School will provide the inspiration for tonight's school board meeting. So I'd like to begin the recognition. Julian Hollis from Bellevue High School, please stand. He matched, he matched at Rice University. Braden Davis from Forest High School matched but has opted out of the program, but we wanted to recognize Brayden. <laughs> Tariq Williams from Forest High School matched at University of California. <laughs> Esperance Hahn, North Marion High School graduate soon, and she matched at Yale University. Braden Hawk, North Marion High School, soon to be graduate, matched at Davidson University. And Veronica Fragoso from Vanguard High School, matched at Duke University. Well, how amazing is that? <laughs> All of this, my goodness. And on, on behalf of the school board, you know, to get a full ride anywhere uh, is an accomplishment, let alone a, a top tier university. So it's certainly something to be incredibly proud of and 
grateful for and what an opportunity and and I know your families are very proud of you and you've kind of joined an elite little cohort up here uh, it's it's just really amazing and many thanks to the schools through the years that have supported you and and the teachers and principals and staff and everybody that has uh, worked with you to help make your dreams come true so it's very very special thank you for taking the time you know, to come out here tonight. I know you have a lot going on, and even on crutches, you were just going to make it happen. So <laughs> there's a testament to dedication right there. <laughs> Thank you again for coming. We'll come down and take a picture after the inspiration. Thank you so much. Yeah, so you come here. Do you have your phone? Yeah. Okay. What do you want me to do? Oh, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Okay. Oh, there, there it is. <laughs> When I reflect back on my high school experience, there's been many times that I thought my world was crashing and burning, and these last four years have been the most stressful, devastating, heartwarming, and exciting, life-changing moments of my life. But what I would want, but I've never, I would never want it any other way. I was like any other teenage student struggling with self-worth, confidence, and doubting myself every step of the way. And what made my journey beautiful were my educators, my counselors, and my best friends, my best friend's families, and my single dad who stepped in and did everything they could for me. Growing up low income with a single father, I didn't think I could have the transportation, the money, or the support to even go and afford a state college. My North Marion High School community are the ones who helped me make all of it happen, assuring me that my dreams were possible despite my circumstance. So cheers to my beautiful educators, counselors, and decision makers that are sitting here today that support and motivate these students. Without you all, I can confidently say that I don't think I could have made it to Yale with a full scholarship. And to the students, cheers to the days I cried in Ms. Spencer's office because I thought I could never make it to college. To the day I received a C on my mid biology midterm, and to the day I broke down in the bathroom from just feeling overwhelmed. I want to share my vulnerable story so that students listening could see that you could do it too. We're all human, and what makes a difference is that you hold on to your dreams. And students of Marion County, you're unstoppable, so don't let any obstacle get in your way. And thank you. Thank you for that wonderful inspiration, and we would be remiss to not say that's some real North Side pride. <laughs> Go Colts. <Yay>. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a picture of all of you. Behind is better. <coughs> Just make sure I can see you. Here we go. And one, two, three, couple more. There's lots of people behind me taking pictures too. Everybody good? Congratulations.
downtown. Hey, Elena. <laughs> but there's one thing we don't have to be sad about tonight. That's it. We're all gone now. That is that's it. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Probably a good thing. And on that note. <laughs> yes. oh. It's always so sad when the recognitions oh, are over. <laughs> it's such a fun time of year. It's just the culmination of all the hard work leading up to graduation. It's, it's just so special and confirmation of, of all of the, I don't know, confidence, expectations, and, and rewards that you, that you reap you know, from, from doing your best. So pretty cool. All right, well, we can talk about some donations. <laughs> we have $1,000 to North Marion High School from the Ocala Preserve Veterans Corporation to be used for the JROTC program. We also have $3,843.71 to Forest High School from Chuck Collins to be divided among select teachers and administration to use at their discretion. We're always so grateful for the donations that we receive. Some of them are cash, some of them are in kind, and they're all uh, given with happy hearts and grateful acceptance. All right, we will move on to uh, tonight's board agenda. Uh, Dr. Gullett, it's time to make a recommendation on tonight's school board meeting agenda. Good evening again, Madam Chair. I recommend approval of the agenda for the April 9th, 2024 school board meeting with the materials in the board packet, those materials distributed to board members at the meeting, and the audio recording included as part of the official record of the meeting with the exception of the following items. D21.1, D21.2, D21.3, D21.4, D21.5, D21.6, D21.7, and D21.8. They have all been placed under discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gullett. May I have a motion on the superintendent's recommendation? Motion. Motion, uh, motion by board member Conrad, second by board member James. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously, 5-0. May I have a motion to approve the minutes for the February 22nd, 2024 administrative briefing and work session? Motion to approve. Motion by Board Member Campbell. Second. Second by Vice Chair Conrad. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously 5-0. May I have a motion to approve the minutes for the February 27th, 2024 school board meeting? So move. Motion by Board Member Cummings. Second. Second by board member James. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes? <laughs> Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously 5-0. May I have a motion to approve the minutes for the February 27th, 2024 special school board meeting? Motion to approve. Motion by board member Campbell. Second by board member Cummings. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously, 5-0. May I have a motion to approve the minutes for the February 27th, 2024 Board of Directors Leasing Corporation meeting? Motion to approve. Motion by Vice Chair Conrad. Second. Second. Ooh, second by <laughs> board, board Member Cummings. Are there any additions or corrections to the meeting, to the minutes? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously, 5-0. Ms. Martinez, would you please provide the proof of publication for tonight's school board meeting? The notice for the April 9th, 2024 school board meeting ran in the Ocala Gazette on March 29th, 2024. The proof of publication has been attached in board docs under proof of publication. Thank you, Ms. Martinez. I'll now move on to persons requesting to address the board. And I'll now ask the school board's attorney to explain the rules governing persons who wish to address the school board this evening. Good evening, Attorney Powers. Good evening, Madam Chair. Thank you. In compliance with section 286.0114 of Florida statutes, the school board has adopted uniform procedures for speakers who wish to speak at this evening's meeting, either regarding one of today's agenda items or a matter relating to the operations of the school district. These procedures will ensure the public has a reasonable opportunity to be heard at, on school board and school district matters. A written summary of these procedures are available on the table in the lobby. Public speaker forms are also located on the same table. The completed forms were due to the school board's clerk no later than 5.40 p.m. 
This evening's speakers will be called prior to the business portion of the school board's meeting in the order of receipt by the school board clerk. Before you begin speaking, please state your full name for the record and spell your last name. Each speaker will have five minutes of time. However, if there are more than five persons who wish to speak, the board may seek consensus to limit each speaker's time to three minutes. When the speaker has one minute remaining, the speaker will receive a visual notice to complete the comments. Speakers may not yield their time to other people. Speakers and meeting attendees are expected to conduct themselves in a respectful manner. Therefore, verbal attacks and profanity are strictly prohibited. And pursuant to the procedures for public comments, item six, speakers are not to identify specific individuals other than themselves or their own child, unless the statement is provided 24 hours in advance. The board is here to listen to your comments only. You may be directed to an administrative staff member following a conclusion of your comments for additional assistance to address your concerns. If there are matters dealing with student discipline, including expulsions, those will be scheduled at the conclusion of the televised portion of this meeting. Parents may, be, may address the board, the board regarding a discipline matter at that time. To ensure student privacy, only a parent or guardian may use a student's first or last name, identifying references to or identification of other students or their families are also prohibited. A speaker's speech does not reflect the endorsement, sponsorship, position, or expression of the school district. Thank you for your attention to this board's rules and requirements. And Madam Chair, that concludes my explanatory remarks. Thank you, Attorney Powers. Ms. Martinez, do we have any speakers this evening? Yes, Madam Chair, we have two speakers. First is Cynthia Moon. Thank you. Good evening, Ms. Moon. Good evening, how are you? Great, how are you? I'm good. Cynthia. I'm Cynthia Moon, M-O-O-N. I'm Troy Pratt, P-R-A-T-T. -T. Can we proceed? Yes, please proceed. Okay. Um, good evening, I am Cindy, and this is Troy. Our granddaughter relocated from New York to Florida on March 16th. On March 20th, our granddaughter was registered as a homeless student at the high school. We were told by administration that would be the quickest way to get her registered and for her to start school on March 25th. We sent emails to each of her teachers on the 28th of March, introducing ourselves, leaving our contact information, so if at any time they need to reach out for any reason concerning our granddaughter's education. As of today, we still have not heard back from any of them. Within the first week of school, she was marked as having several missed assignments and marked absent from class. I reached out to the school questioning the miss, missed assignments. They were marked in error. Troy went to the school the day that she was marked absent from the one class to where she, oh, I'm sorry, an error. He went, to the, he went to the school. She was in class. The teacher just checked the box as absent. Is this a reoccurring habit from the academic staff? Our granddaughter was given a Chromebook for home use. She was not given any instruction how to use the Chromebook, nor to make her way around the canvas. After expressing my concerns to the assistant principal on April 1st about her not having any instruction, she was called down to the media room on April 2nd for instruction on how to navigate within the Chromebook. Why such the delay for instruction? On April 2nd, Troy sent an email to the math teacher expressing his concerns about math skills and asked for the teacher to reach out to him so he could further discuss the issue. As of today, we still have not heard any response from the teacher. From March 18th to April 1st, we had ask access to the Sky Portal. We would check that portal frequently so we would know what was going on with assignments and et cetera. Now we have no access and no way to check no way to check, it was taken away. On April 1st, I went to the school and asked to speak with the head of academics, the school council, and the principal. I met only with the assistant school principal. I talked about the concerns of lack of communication from teachers, the mistakes that were made within the first four days of school, and our concerns for her education. I spoke with the assistant principal about the reason for her relocation and asked him if he'd been met been made aware of the reason or read the reports from Child Protective Services that were provided to the school. His response was not personally himself. 
the principal had told her that she can go to him and the school counselor at any time with any matter. If the school principal, the school counselor, and the teaching team had read even the reports that were provided, they would know what type of environment she was coming from. She is not going to reach out to her peers as she trusts no one. We are concerned about the lack of communication, support from the school and teaching staff when it comes to her education at the school. At the end of the meeting with the, school, the assistant school principal, he told me at that time, by law, he cannot discuss anything educational with us due to the fact she was registered homeless. Our granddaughter was present for this meeting. We were never told about the consequences of registering our granddaughter as homeless. He did, not, he did tell me that we had the right to drop off, pick up, and be contacted in case of an emergency. The documents that were provided to register as a regular student was the original birth certificate, original social security card, proof of re residency, the legal document from the state of Florida department immunization record, and the notarized document from the biological mother granting Troy temporary guardianship. The state department of Florida health accepted all those documents for proof of the immunization record. Why is it that the high school won't? We, as her grandparents, provide a loving home, stable and safe environment for her, and are her best advocates for education. We are asking for her to be registered as a regular student so we have access to communication, teacher meetings, and able to make our own academical decisions in the best interest of our granddaughter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, and, and thank you for coming before us, um, Dr. Gullett. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Livengood is right behind you, Ms. Moon, and she will assist you. And I'm, I am very sorry for any miscommunication on behalf of my team. Thank you. Thank you. We're glad to have you. We're the same. Thank you, Ms. Moon. Thank you, thank sir. You. Grace Daly. My name is Grace Daly, and it's D-A-L-E-Y. Good evening, ma'am. I can go ahead? Yes, please. Yes. Okay, thank you, Dr. Gullett and the Marion County School Board for the opportunity to be here. I am a proud product of MCPS K through 12. How she taught in the school system for seven years, was honored to be a Golden Apple recipient. Um, went on from here to Tulane University, was ended up drafted in the WNBA, played on four different teams in the WNBA and played for seven years in Europe in five different countries. So scoreboards and numbers mean a lot to me. So I know I have four minutes and 33 seconds to lay a very important problem at your feet. So numbers, um, the last few years, God placed on my heart is uh, I volunteered at different places, um, drug and alcohol rehab centers and foster care group homes. And when I learned about the plight of some of our students being in a Marion County Public School class, and one of my students had their head down on the desk before lunch, and I said, well, what's happening? He said, I don't know if I'm gonna be here tomorrow. And I said, well, why not? He was in the foster system, and he was getting moved to a new home out of county, okay? And he was maybe gonna get separated from his sister. So everything that he knew was being taken away and that could happen the next day. And in Marion County, I'm not sure if you're aware of these numbers, but we have 741 children in out of home care. About half of those are with a ma, with a grandma or a grandpa or an aunt and uncle, but they didn't expect that and they need our support. Um, the statistics as far as the school system is concerned, 45% of students or children who are in foster care do not complete high school. And as excited as I was to see all of the Merit Scholars, my heart is broken that there are some of our students that may never have that opportunity. 20,000, over 20,000 youth age out of foster care, they turn 18 every year, and of those 20,000, 20% 20 become instantly homeless. 80% of the males will be incarcerated, and about 60% of the females will be victims of sex trafficking. Overall, for our community, what this looks like is 50% of the homeless that we have are they were in foster care. They spent time in foster care. 
percent of girls and women rescued from sex trafficking raids spent time in foster care and 75 percent of the incarcerated spent time in foster care so this is just like education being in the classroom it's a do or die situation um i would you know those statistics they do seem dismal but in the right hands those children could have different outcomes if you look at your bible the book of esther esther was in foster care, raised by her cousin Mordecai and raised royalty. Moses was in foster care. And Moses ended up changing the course of history and the greatest figure that ever lived, Jesus Christ, in foster care. Joseph wasn't his daddy, right? So in the right hands, these children can have amazing outcomes. So what I want to present to you, Marion County School Board, is an opportunity, an opportunity to do something. Angel Studios, are you all familiar with Angel Studios? who came out with The Chosen, last 4th of July, they came out with The Sound of Freedom, right? And that movie shed light on what was happening in sex trafficking. This 4th of July, there's a movie called Possum Trot, P-O-S-S-U-M, Possum Trot, about a small community, a small town in East Texas that really ended the foster care crisis in their town. So Angel Studios, my nonprofit's called Everyday Jesus. Angel Studios has granted my nonprofit an exclusive private screening of this film on May 9th at the Marion Theater. Um, Marion Theater, shout out to Mr. Gurr's Grace Christian School. He's here to support today. He made one phone call and Adam Volpe from the Marion Theater said they would donate the space. So we have two screenings that are planned. The first screening, I'm inviting all heads of agencies in the counties, um, heads of nonprofits, business owners. I would love to see guidance counselors, school psychologists um, at this meeting also. I would love more than anything else to see the school board represented to show solidarity and support for our children. Um, the mayor and his wife, Ben Marciano, are already on board. And yesterday, I was able to, by God's grace, convince them to do a second screening. The second screening will happen two weeks later, May 23rd, at the Marion Theater. And this will be for church leadership. I had a mission trip in the British Islands, the British Virgin Islands, about over spring break, and I asked them how many kids they had in foster care. They said they have one. And I said, how is this possible? They said, it's possible because there was this pastor beside me, and he said, we have so many churches on this island, right? Marion County has over 400 churches. And I can tell you what, if we can just cross the lines of race, class, and culture, and get together for these children, we can, we can rewrite, right? We can rewrite history and we can do something that will give these kids the bright future and the bright hope that I know each and every one of you all have in your hearts. So um, my, my, my Fantastic Five, you have an invitation in your inbox already. I'll get the other emails and send them to you. Thank you very much. Hope to see you there. What time on May 9th? <laughs> What time, May 9th, what time? May 9th at five o'clock. So from five to six, that's gonna be the social hour. And then from six to 6.15, I'll do opening remarks. From 6.20 to 8.30 is the actual showing of the film. And then from 8.30 to 8.45, closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Sounds very organized, just like your presentation was. <laughs> Praise Jesus, and, thank you. I continue to be a fan of yours, Ms. Daly. Thank you for what you've done through the years for our students and what you continue to do for our kids in our community. And thank you for what you do and for the opportunity you allowed me. <laughs> so I appreciate that. Ms. Daly, thank you because you are a product of Marion County Public right? Schools and you did go on and do things. <clears throat> but I want to congratulate you and applaud you for not staying away. You came back home to make a difference. So thank you for that. Yep, we appreciate it. I appreciate you all and thank you for your kind words. Thank you. Have a great evening. You too. Thank you very much. Does that conclude our speakers, Ms. Martinez? <laughs> Madam Chair. All right, thank you. Ending on an inspiration, I like it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> all right, uh, we will move on to uh, board item 9.1, which is information only per board policy 6320. Staff is notifying the board of an accepted substituted item contained on bid 3987AH for classroom supplies for the central warehouse. The original awarded item contained on bid 3987AH was discontinued by the manufacturer and the awarded vendor of said item proposed an alternate product. The alternate product was reviewed by staff and determined the item was necessary acceptable and lower in price than the secondary awardees bid price and therefore the substituted item was accepted all right <clears throat>
Moving on, may I have a motion to approve consent agenda items C11.1 through C20.2, with the exception of items D21.1, D21.2, D21.3, D21.4, D21.5, D21.6, D21.7, and D21.8 that have been placed under discussion. May I have a motion, please? Motion to approve consent agenda items. Motion by Board Member Cummings. Second. Second by Vice Chair Conrad. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously, 5-0. All right, moving on to discussion <laughs> items. We'll start with D21.1. May I have a motion to approve bid 4057 GM tree trimming services? Motion to approve. Motion by Board Member James. Second by Board Member Cummings. Dr. Gullett, do you have information you would like to share regarding this item? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. I don't have any additional items. I think a board member wants to speak to this item. Okay, board members? Just, I need to recuse from this vote, thank you. Okay, uh, let the record show that Vice Chair Conrad will be recusing um, from this vote. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously, four votes to zero, with Vice Chair Conrad abstaining. All right, moving on to D21.2. May I have a motion to approve replacement of chilled water system at Building 8 at Spar Elementary School, Project 24-126. So moved. Moved by Board Member Cummings. Second. Second by Board Member Campbell. Dr. Gullett, do you have information you would like to share regarding this item? Thank you. Um, members of the board, uh, Madam Chair, so you'll see again the pattern from previous meetings. 21.2 through 21.5 are all grouped together and they all pertain to the maintenance of our aging buildings, uh, which includes, of course, this first one. So uh, we just group them together for ease of, of understanding um, what we're needing to do for our buildings. I can go ahead, Madam Chair, if you'd like, I could go ahead and give you the cost of each or we could do it individually, however you prefer. I know you have to just take um, them one at a time. Let's do it individually as, as okay. we vote would be my preference. So the cost of this one is? This one is 791276 for um, the system. Okay. For SPAR. Okay. Thank you very much. Is there any anything further, Dr. Gullett? Nothing further. Thank you. Okay. Is there any uh, discussion um, from the board on this 791 plus item? <laughs> Thousand. <laughs> All right, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously, five to zero. Moving on to item D21.3, may I have a motion to approve the replacement of roofs at buildings 18 and 24 at North Marion High School, project 124. Motion to approve. Motion by Vice Chair Conrad. Second. Second by Board Member Campbell. Dr. Gullett, do you have information you would like to share regarding this item? Certainly. Again, the cost, um, if you approve, is 689425 to replace those roofs for those two buildings. Thank you, Dr. Gullett. Is there any discussion from the board? Yes, Dr. James. Just an observation. It's project number 24-125. I think you said dash 124. Oh, I'm sorry. But the record show 24-125. Thank you. Yes. And the roofs do leak. So these, yep. the roofs do leak. So uh, no, one, no one who lives in those spaces on a regular basis will be upset with a new roof. Um, there's constant water dripping as soon as uh, it, the rain comes. So. It's like $689,000 well spent. <laughs> all right. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously, 5-0. All right, may I have a motion to approve replacement of roof at Building 8 at North Marion High School, Project 23-130? Motion to approve. Motion by Board Member James. Second. Second by Board Member Campbell. Dr. Gullett, do you have information you would like to share regarding this item? Certainly. Again, the cost to replace the roof on Building 8 of North Marion High School, $1,959. Thank you. Any discussion from the board? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously, five 
Zero. May I have a motion to approve replacement of roofs in buildings one and two at North Marion Middle School, project 23-140. Motion to approve. Motion by Vice Chair Conrad. Second. Second by Board Member James. Dr. Gullett, do you have information that you'd like to share regarding this item? Certainly, again, on the north side, North Marion Middle, uh, the roofs um, need to be replaced in buildings one and two. The cost is $1,839,920 on this one. Okay, thank you very much. Is there any discussion from the board? I just have one comment. Yes. My only request as a board member who has looked at the whole picture kind of from a step back would be that as we continue to plan projects in the future, that we work from the top down and not the bottom up because we replace the lights and all of the ceiling tiles at North Marion with the hope, and I think the AC, with the hope that the roof could hold out, but the roof can't hold out. And the people who live there kind of could tell you that the, I mean, they're not roofers, but they could tell you that the roof wasn't going to be able to hold out. And so we've wound up having to approve money to go towards replacing ceiling tiles, to go towards replacing lights, brand new LED lights, because the roof didn't have as much time left in it as was previously thought of. And we didn't have the money budgeted to pay for the roof in the fiscal year that we had to pay for the other things. And so it's all... I, I completely acknowledge it's all very complex because there's just not enough money to address all of the needs at one time. Um, but if there's an opportunity as we continue to go forward where we could do a roof before we do an interior renovation, I would just at least like that for that to be reviewed. Um, when, I, when we were elected to the board, um, this project was already kind of in the works uh, for the interior work, the lights and all of that, because that all happened last summer, and the AC happened last summer. So um, I totally understand that there's not really enough money to make it all happen at the same time. But if we could work from the outside in in the future, that would be my request as a board member. Thank you, board member James. Is there any further discussion from the board? Dr. Gullett? Uh, certainly. Thank you, Madam Chair. I believe that that was part of the plan and there were some um, unexpected issues that came up. I think it was HVAC was one of them. So they had, we had to address that. That's yeah, the HVAC wound up taking precedent. And so, because it, it also failed and it's failing is more significant than yeah. the roof failing. It's just, it's a delicate thing. And then we wind up spending more money. And sometimes that's just what happens? Sometimes that's just the way the cookie crumbles. But if there's a way for us to finagle it differently, I would just want to try and do that because ultimately it all is going to have to be done. And so just wanted to make that point. And I would agree. I just, uh, that is also part of why we have this perfect storm of our aging facilities, all things happening at one time. And we would, I, I do agree, uh, Dr. James would like to do it in that way. And we're just hoping in some of our schools that things don't fail so that we can do them in a logical order. But as you all know, we're, we're close in some places and making sure that we can maintain them and have the money to maintain them. So yes, I appreciate the comment. Thank you. Thank you all for the, for the points and, and the discussion. It really does um, bring, bring to, to light <laughs> Uh, that when there's not enough money to go around, you know, you, you become forced to make decisions to keep things going and in an order that really, if the funding were better, we wouldn't be forced to make these decisions to just keep cobbling things together on a wing and a prayer and hoping that they'll hold till we have money for the big stuff. So um, I would definitely say that I'm looking forward to a time as a board member when we're able to better cover um, the expenses that we've known that we've had, the needs that we've had, and have at least uh, less limited funding um, to be able to do that because those are terrible decisions to have to make. Do we, do we turn on the lights or do we have air conditioning or do we put a patch on the roof and hope it holds? <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So looking forward to moving away from that uh, <laughs> reactive planning. <laughs> all right, uh, if there's no further discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously 5-0. All right, moving on to item D21.6. May I have a motion to approve State of Florida contract 4321000-23 Omnia-ACS Technology Products Solutions and Related Services. Motion to approve. Motion by Board Member Campbell. Second. <clears throat> Second by Vice Chair Conrad. Dr. Gullett, do you have any information you'd like to share regarding this item? Uh, certainly. Again, a couple of items here. This, the cost for this item is $410,000, and this is to replace aging um, access points for our wireless connectivity. So again, aging, but in a different um, in a different area in technology. So this is to replace those um, with current wireless access points so that we can continue to try to improve the accessibility for our students and staff. Thank you, Dr. Gullett. Is there any further discussion from board members? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously 5-0. Moving on to D21.7, may I have a motion to approve the Memorandum of Understanding with the Marion Education Support Professionals? Motion to approve. Motion by Vice Chair Conrad. Second. Second by Board Member James. Dr. Gullett, um, do you have additional information you would like to share regarding this item? Certainly, thank you. Um, board, with your approval tonight, this will allow us to hire our own interns and our um, graduates of uh, Vanguard High School's uh, Future Educator Academy for summer school if we have those vacancies available, so be able to hire our own into those positions with this agreement. Thank you. Thank you. Any discussion or comments from the board? I see smiles. <laughs> <laughs> I was just super excited to, to read through this, um, and I hope they'll invite us to come come by. I'd love to see if that, that happens, if there's availability and we have students um, that are participating in that. I just think it's really exciting. So thank you for sharing. And we'll be sure to let you know. We'll let the team is, is listening intently. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair, Board Member James. Uh, I personally employ one of the students who's a Vanguard um, senior and is in the Future Educator Program, so at my preschool, and I'm not going to um, be lending her out this summer, but she's amazing, and I can see, it's really very cool for me to see in live action the fruits of what uh, Marion County Public Schools is delivering to her as a student, and then she is producing within my school, private school setting. And so um, it's really, it's so awesome to see kind of the full circle of it. And I think this is amazing because if the vacancies are there and we don't have, we don't have the bodies to fill them, why, you know, what better way than to reach into our own pool of candidates because there's some really awesome, we call them kids, but they're really young adults and they're doing really great stuff. So I just wanted to share that little note. Thank you. Um Board Member James, and gosh, I certainly concur. It's, it's just such an amazing opportunity. And, and these young adults have had a chance to really see and, and work with our kids. And so they're prepared, and, and I know they'll be very well supported. Sure. Yes. I, too, want to um, comment on this one. This is this um, Future Leaders Educators Academy is truly um, an awesome thing for our district. And I, I want to commend um, Principal Carlisle and the Vanguard staff and Ms. Piner, Ajane Piner, because they work very, very hard with these kids, um, these young adults. And they're, they're, we're growing our own teachers. We're growing our own educators. And I, I, I'm hoping that this is something that's going to go beyond just Vanguard High School because it's very, it's very much needed. We know there's teacher shortages, educator shortages, and this is, a, this is an opportunity for these kids to get into the field of education. So. I, I applaud them for what they're doing over there, Bangor. You bet, you bet. <coughs> Remember Campbell, we all have something to say sure. about this. <laughs> Thank you, so why not chime in here? So I'm gonna take it from a little different vein because I think that the other board members have definitely talked about how amazing our program is to grow our own with future leaders, uh, future educators. I'm going to say thank you to the veterans 
that are a part of MESP and the other folks that actually have to help us ensure that we can do this innovative uh, partnership. And so the purpose of this agenda item is an MOU with our MESP union, Marion Education Support Professionals, with the understanding, they understand that we are going to be growing our own and it only helps us all. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm just grateful for the opportunity that we're going to have to vote on this item. Absolutely. Thank you, Board Member Campbell. And, and I think we have some input from our student board member too, Mr. Knight. Yes. Um, yeah, I think it's, um, I know some of my peers that are at Vanguard, they're in that program. And I think that it would be a very good opportunity for many of the students to be able to fill those vacancies that I know you guys have here. And I also think that it could be a very well useful pro program for many of the high schools in Marion County. Good job, Vic. Yeah. <laughs> yes. thank, you, thank, you thank you for the panel. Yeah, we <laughs> yes, yes, you and you and Mr. Uh, Board Member Cummings are in agreement yeah. on that one. And they and say these kids don't pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> they pay excellent attention. They sure do. All right. Well, this has been awesome. I think we're ready to go ahead and vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously, 5-0, and we're already wishing the best of luck to the candidates um, that they'll get the opportunity um, to do this this summer, and, and we'll be really happy to see that happen. All right, moving on to item D21.8, may I have the mo motion to approve the proposed central office staffing plan for 2024-2025 fiscal year. Motion to approve. Motion by Vice Chair Conrad. Second. Second by Board Member James, um, Dr. Gullett, any information in addition you'd like to share on this item? Thank you, Madam Chair. Just briefly, uh, members of the board, as you know, we had a, a recent discussion uh, at a work session about the central office staffing plan, because we are all the district. Um, and this central office staffing plan uh, showed a decrease of 28 positions from central office, again, reminding everyone that the ESSER dollars um, are concluding this year, and so our, our primary um, plan was to make sure that we protect the schools with those positions, and so that's why you see a net uh, reduction of 28 from the central office. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gullett. Um, any discussion, commentary from the board? Board Member Campbell? Thank you. I was going to save this for my board comments, but because the whole um, impetus for my original conversation was actually this district staffing plan. I just want to say thank you to the team and all the many people that I've spoken with over the last week since we had this conversation. Uh, now that we have the staffing plan in front of us and the former program specialist ESE position has been changed and it is now going, or there is going to now be a different position that will be a gifted resource teacher. I see that clearly here. Um, just grateful for the team and the folks who heard my concerns and have addressed them. And I understand that there was a wonderful focus group that happened yesterday of some of our, our existing gifted uh, educators and their voices and concerns were heard as well. And I know that that will just be continuing um, understanding that uh, we have several thousand students that this impacts and several thousand or a couple families, couple thousand families that this impacts as well. Um, just grateful that the vision is out there. And so uh, hopefully the legs will be put to it once we make this approval tonight. So thank you. Thank you, Board Member Campbell. Any other comments or discussion from the board? Vice Chair Conrad. Um, I just have a question uh, really for, for Dr. Gullett. Um, and this doesn't fit exactly into this conversation, but it is related, so it's the best place, I think, to ask. Um, in recent school visits, there's, there's been um, some difficulty with the new threat assessment um, paperwork that comes through administration. And I just wondered, as we looked at the staffing plan in the future, I would personally like more information about how our staff um, are provided assistance in getting those accomplished. So one that I recently um, was able to look at was literally a three ring binder for one incident, um, one threat that was made at a school. And so looking in at what our administrators are asked to do already and the time restraints on the 48 hours they have to complete that, um, you know, the first section is 19 questions and interviews and then 14 questions, and it's, it's very uh, in, um, detailed. And so, 
we look at schools that may have two or three incidents a week. Um, how are we, how are our staff managing that and how are we supporting them in managing that? And so although it doesn't fit directly into this conversation, I would just like to know more um, on the school level, how our administrators um, get support in getting those done in a timely manner. Thank you, Vice Chair Conrad. Thank you, um, Vice Chair Conrad. Thank you for that. So that, so that I'm clear, a threat assessment, so any type of threat by a student inside school, outside of school, any type of threat, the threat assessment process. Correct. Yep. And so okay. I know that's a state requirement. I know that's yes. something that we have to do. Yep. But we all know the state mandates things and there's no funding or you know anything attached to it and so it is a it's a big job and it's very important mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. i just wanted to have a better understanding of how um, our district is moving through um, filling out and completing all of that paperwork how you know how it has to be submitted and turned in um, so i have a better understanding of how that's processed. I appreciate that. And and we will also we'll get we'll gather that data, but we'll also include that in because we will be having a work session on some of the new requirements from safe schools from the state level. And um, so I know Mr. McFadden's out here as well. We'll include that in there because there are a lot of new requirements, as you all know, and many are not yet funded. Some are, we're expecting to have some funding, but we need to have some conversation publicly with the board and with the public about what that looks like to make sure that we're, and as you know, we're committed to safety is our priority, right? Right up there with student outcomes. Can't have student outcomes improve unless we have safe um, classrooms and buildings. But um, we will be doing a, 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 a work session on that and that we'll include this as well because there's a lot, a lot of things happening right now with that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Okay. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Five zero. <clears throat> all right. We will move on now to board committee uh, reports. A uh, special board meeting has been scheduled for April 11th, 2024 at 7 a.m. The next administrative briefing and work session has been scheduled for April 11th, 2024 at 9 a.m. The following administrative briefing and work session has been scheduled for May 2nd at 9 a.m. All right, and moving on, uh, Ms. Martinez, anything from your seat tonight? No, Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you, and thank you for all you do. Attorney Powers? Nothing from legal, thank you. Thank you, appreciate it. Dr. Gullett? Just briefly, board. Um, we've, we've had a great celebration tonight, our students, our staff, um, thanks to our, our community and families. I also want to thank our volunteers, and April is Florida School Volunteer Appreciation Month, so um, regularly see our volunteers out in our schools and really appreciate all they're doing to support our students. And I want to do a shout out to someone, we don't get a lot of attention sometimes um, out in the field. I was I joined in on, on the horticulture tour today at one of our schools and um, led by Chris Roy, so thank you to the work that they're doing in our partnership with Marion County Hospital District to have our students creating, a, growing, not creating, growing <laughs> in our schools and they turn around and they're, they're getting to eat in our cafeterias what they're growing. And in seeing our, we had our um, ESC students hard at work um, and they were building and CTE is part of that partnership and growing and students get to learn great life skills and business skills and, and producing. And so what a great partnership all the way around across our departments, but also with our communities. So I just wanted to do a special recognition of that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gullett. Mr. Nygaard, anything from your seat, sir? Um, just briefly, I'd like to thank the board for the, um, especially um, district uh, board member James for uh, her comments on restoring the older parts of the schools because I at Lake Weir this year we had a little incident where a whole building the entire air conditioning went out and we had to move over to the gym for a whole day I mean that that definitely messed up my learning that day and I had to I mean I didn't have to do my presentation that day which was good but definitely so definitely reminding. I wish I wish it was air conditioning but I, I thank the board for the restoration of most of the 
schools, especially North Marion, because I've visited North Marion, and the, the roofs definitely need a little bit of maintenance. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Coming straight from the trenches. We appreciate yes. that. <laughs> All right. Uh, Board Member Campbell. Sure, I, and I'll just piggyback on that. So we did approve a lot of repairs on our aging buildings this evening. Uh, tonight's uh, focus was on the north side, but it doesn't mean that we won't have others uh, on the south side or, or elsewhere uh, that we are in need of significant repairs. I, um, similar to Dr. James' recommendation that we look uh, from the outside in, I also, uh, from this board seat, am looking for strategies on potentially um, combinations of, of schools in the future. And hopefully we will have additional funding sources coming to us in the next several months. And if that happens, then I know that our five-year work plan will be impacted even more significantly as we strategize towards the future and what we possibly can do to um, lessen the load on some of those older buildings and create new spaces and, and newer spaces for folks to be able to uh, work and uh, ed be educated. So that's that first comment. Um, I also had the privilege recently to travel with the hippie program. I think some of us have already done that, but uh, being able to go out and see a young parent uh, and her young children and our team members at work helping that parent know how to educate her young children. It was, it was a unique experience. Honestly, I, I guess I thought that our team member was going to be going out and actually teaching the children the curriculum, and that is not at all what occurs. It's coaching a parent in how to educate. And so I can only imagine that that program is significant in how we are able to move up the ladder on kindergarten readiness for Marion County. And I've learned recently that there used to be even more of these um, folks in the hippie program. And as one retires or whatever, we haven't replaced that position. And so we don't have as many as we once did. And I personally believe that it would be important for us to look at potentially using additional funding sources, maybe Title I from multiple schools. I think we could use even more of those individuals to help continue the kindergarten readiness that we're having in Marion County. We made a significant step. We were 66 out of 67 counties. And so the more we're able to go in the highways and byways of Marion County, educating young parents on how they can be their child's first educator, I can only see that as a benefit to us moving forward. Additionally, wow, that 1991 Ford station wagon. Let me just tell you, so people may be uh, critical of the white fleet that Marion County Public Schools has, and so perhaps we do purchase new vehicles from time to time. But I had the privilege of riding in a 1991 Ford station wagon with only AM a radio in it, with the roll down windows, with uh, the gear shift on the column, the whole shebang. And I'm like, walk down memory lane. So while we have the need for lots of different types of vehicles, certainly if they're still running, we're using them. So that was a lot of fun, uh, but also a kind of a, an eye opener to say that we do have new vehicles in our white fleet, but we also are getting all the, work, all the use out of the ones that we have um, that are still running and ticking. So I had the opportunity after that hippie visit to, to uh, talk with Miss Beck at Fordham, and that is certainly a hidden gem. If there are any young parents that are looking for a magnet program for their early learner, and I'm going to call it a magnet program. I don't know that they've actually been coined that term yet, but I'm calling it that. Uh, they are a hidden gem and uh, certainly an opportunity as they continue to grow the classroom space there for our early learners. Just really grateful for the team at Fordham and all the things they're doing. Uh, in a recent meeting, I mentioned the SREF uh, opportunities and as we're building a new high school and looking ahead to what the um, requirements are from education, uh, DOE, I, I've learned that SREF is a challenge to change, but I'm never um, going to cower from a challenge if it still is the right thing to do. So continued conversation will be coming forward board as we do even more research as to when some of those standards were put into place in conjunction with when 
FHSAA advanced indoor athletics because I, I believe the two haven't necessarily gone hand in hand. Uh, there are some other districts, um, Seminole in particular, that has some gymnasiums on a couple of high school campuses and a middle school campus that they share with their county. And so they use them as almost multi-purpose facilities that the county has with um, Parks and Recreation. So I've sent those agreements and how those uh, letters of understanding are between the Seminole School District and the county and what that looks like. Um, so I think that there might be opportunity for continued discussion and as specifically on the one high school, they do use a field house as this kind of multi-purpose, also community center of sorts. Um, and it's on a high school campus, but they're, they're partnering with the county on that. So continued discussion uh, as we move forward. Speaking of the county, I, I recently had the opportunity to visit the county commission auditorium as well as the city council chambers. And just as a point of note, they both have been completely remodeled with new seating, new technology, new audio at our city and our county. Just going to leave that there. I am looking forward to the finance forum that several of us board members will be attending next week, Florida School Board Association Finance Forum on Thursday and Friday of next week. And I also wanted to, to mention as the, my final um, statement, the Central Florida School Boards Coalition meeting was yesterday, uh, serving as vice chair uh, has been a wonderful opportunity and looking forward to serving as chair next year. In the vice chair role, we have opened up the opportunity to have round table discussions now. And so I just wanted to give you all a preview. Our speaker coming up in May will be the CFO from Lake County that hopefully we'll be able to piggyback on some of the things that we talk about at FSBA Finance Forum uh, next week from the FEFP. But we're also going to have a round table specifically on board member and superintendent relationships. And then in June, we have already set a round table when we're all at the breakfast that happens at conference. Uh, we had a specific request from a board member uh, from Volusia County asking for board members and, and superintendents to come with effective strategies to positively impact the student vaping epidemic and crisis that is hitting us all. So be on the lookout for that. Just it, our June, our breakfast meetings are usually kind of pomp and circumstance in a way, but we're going to come this time with actually a round table where we can have a, a hard, heavy discussion on strategies that are working elsewhere. And so looking forward to just continued collaboration with other districts around the state. So that's all I have. Thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, board member Campbell, and, and definitely great and timely action items. Uh, you brought up and thank you for your continued um, good work as our advocacy person for FSBA. All right, board member James. Thank you. Um, really, Dr. Campbell hit on a lot of the, the stuff that we have done in the last couple of weeks. The hippie visit was great. Um, it was awesome to go into a home. You never know what you're going to experience and it was a wonderful visit. So that was wonderful. And actually, I do think God puts you in the right place at the right time. Um, I was able to share with the parent about um, they had gone to Fiddler's, but they were, they were really hesitant about putting their child in public school because they are concerned about lots of things that young parents are concerned about. Anyhow, I connected um, the mom with the principal at Greenway, and she was going to get a tour so that she could get her child enrolled in some pre-K ESC programs that we have, which is going to help prepare their student for kindergarten. And so it was just kind of a great opportunity. Um, and it, it made me think, well, how else could we embed those resources into the hippie program? Because the hippie um, staff member didn't really understand that side of the table. And so I was able to kind of close the gap there. But she had been trying to convince mom that going to the school setting was going to be the best thing for the child. And so that was just kind of, you know, a God moment there. So that was great. Um, next week, Monday and Friday, I will be taking on hundreds and hundreds of miles with the team as we go and look at prototypes for Lake Weir Middle School's replacement. So we are headed all the way to 
I don't know, like three and a half hours south of here, and then doing all kinds of visits between Monday and Friday to hopefully find a prototype that will be best. Mr. Jacobs, the Lake Room Middle School principal, is coming with us, uh, and a few other people, and hopefully we'll find a prototype that is going to be and serve as an amazing place of learning for that school, which has been on the to-do list for many a year. So I'm looking forward to that opportunity, and we're also interviewing four um, finalists for the, con the uh, construction manager for the high school at the end of the month. So we will be doing those interviews in two weeks, I think, and then uh, that will be coming before the board, and that is a pretty big item, and so there were actually f only four books that even got put in for it. So all four candidates who put in a book are going to receive a um, interview since but it is such a large project that the pool of people who are ready and able to participate gets smaller and smaller the larger the project gets. That's what I'm learning in this process. So um, those are kind of some updates. I just wanted to share as I, uh, I live in Anthony and I do a lot of my life in downtown Ocala. And so outside of kind of that little thoroughfare, I travel to schools. But I don't really go outside of that area unless I'm traveling to schools. I do a lot of my shopping in that little thoroughfare. And so I was driving to Moe's yesterday. And uh, we went out there a couple weeks ago for the groundbreaking. We kind of took that route to the Winding Oaks property and then kind of down south. And I um, don't drive out there every day, so I don't understand. Um, and honestly, it's probably more impactful to me because I don't drive it every day. So I, we were just there for the groundbreakings maybe two weeks ago, three weeks ago. And what I saw, on, I think it was yesterday, was different and more wood and roofs than what I saw even two or three weeks ago when we did the groundbreakings. And then as I was visiting with Ms. Dreer at Moe's, she had just gone over 1,100 students. She was at 1,109 on Monday morning, which then prompted me to look at the attendance report, and which I check daily at certain schools. And Sunrise hit 1,400 students yesterday. Um, and we, the, um, it's, it's as if I'm, my concern as a board member, and this is what I have expressed to anyone that will listen, is we are going to open the two elementary schools and they will be, they will be beyond capacity, is my, is my dire concern. And we're building them and they're designed for a wing to be added on. And Ms. Dobbins is gonna kill me. And the, 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 she just, she's laughing. The wheels are already in motion, but if there was a way that we could find another $10 million to put the wing on the school, it would probably be in the back. I mean, I'm, I'm not the planner person, but all I can see is that Sunrise is probably going to have 1,500 kids by the time that we get to the rezoning at the end of next school year. And just from basic math, you could, that entire school is going to fill another school. And so my, my, like, gravest concern is that we are only going to scrape the top of solving our problem and we are also going to be in a we're going to be in a hole financially I mean we're still in a safe space but we don't have this cup runneth over of money to just plug more money in to build another school and to build another wing because we already have line itemed all 330 million dollars to go to other projects and so I'm just really concerned that if there's a possibility that we could plan any better, I just want us to really have some authentic, honest conversation about it because they, the people are here. Forget they're coming. They are here and I mean, when you walk into an elementary school and it literally says welcome and there are names and the names change every single day. And they're not going. There's no kids going. The number is not going down and coming up with seasonal workers, how it maybe used to be in Marion Oaks community specifically. That is not happening much anymore. They are just coming and coming and coming. And so I just want us to have super authentic conversation about any possible way we could maximize any space because they are going to open 
beyond capacity. And my concern is the pressure valve that we're supposed to be releasing from Moe's and Hamo and Sh um, Shady Hill and Saddlewood and Sunrise, the pressure valve is not going to release enough pressure. And then we're still going to be in the same spot. And so then we'll have rezoned and, and, and disrupted hundreds, thousands of students and we'll still be in an uncomfortable spot. And if that is just the reality and we're doing the best job possible, I am okay with that reality. I just really want to make sure that we have dotted every possible I and crossed every T. And if there is a way, Ms. Boston Ellis is probably really mad at me, because if there's a way that we could find another $20 million to basically put on a wing at each of those elementary schools, or maybe just the more southern one, the one that's going to take from Sunrise, because that seems to be where there's more growth, although you look at the Winding Oaks and there's just every single thing is a house. So I don't know. I've rambled a bit, but I'm just really concerned from, from a perspective of planning that I want to be able to confidently say we have done the absolute best job preparing for this because often as we travel, I say, I can't be held responsible for the sins of the boards of the past. I can only be held responsible for what we're doing right now and what we are going to continue to do to be proactive and solve problems. And I want to make sure that I can stand firmly and say, we are solving this problem to the best possible ability. And as I look at all of those roofs and see all of those kids, I just worry. So I guess I'll end with that. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> You're going to get some spirited responses. Thank you, uh, Board Member James. Um, Can I just? Yes, I just want to piggy off real quick because I had really the exact same sentiment when I left Hammett Bowen this morning. And you drive in again, it's not a regular path for me. Um, and it was exciting, all the equipment was there working on the new elementary school. But as I went in, and, and they're at 1,000 students right now, and there's a development that's going to have 2,100 homes. I thought the exact same thing. I go, this new school is going to be at capacity before we even open. So I just, Dr. James, thank you for opening up the conversation um, that we do look at numbers carefully and all the research that's been done so that we are being proactive. Um, and part of that is the relief, some relief for our principals at those schools that are so over capacity. Um, you know, they're just holding their breath uh, for these new schools to open. And so um, I just, I want to reiterate that. Thank you for the conversation. I think both schools too are going to be at capacity as soon as we open the doors. Thank you, Vice Chair Conrad. Uh, Board Member Campbell. Sure. I, I was going to say here, here. That is what I originally was going to say, but it, it also um, begs the question. I, I personally believe this individual board member believes that when we redistrict, it's not just going to be redistricting just in the South. I believe that it's going to have to be district wide, that we're going to pull this Band-Aid off. It's going to be a really difficult, challenging couple of conversations, maybe more than a couple that we're going to have to have. And I know the team is already working on that, but uh, it, we may also have some tough conversations about some schools from this seat that I'm seeing that have a lot, a lot of open seats mm -hmm. in the schools. What does that look like mm -hmm. as we are redistricting and uh, as individual families are choosing elsewhere or not to attend specific schools for whatever reason that might be. So um, as we add magnet programs, as we continue to enhance certain areas, but we definitely have pockets within the community that are bursting beyond their seams and have been for years. And then we have other pockets that have plenty of space. So it's just a greater conversation, but thank you for having it because I, I believe just as you have stated that specifically in those areas, if we are not wanting kids to be on buses for hours on end, we need to not only release the pressure valve, we need to ensure that there's gonna be enough space for all the pressure that's coming there. So thank you for that. Thank you, Board Member Campbell. And um, there is so much conversation that needs to continue across the community on this topic. And there's two things that come to mind. First one is, uh, I'm not sure that I would 
define it as sins of boards of the past because I think some of our boards of the past have been saviors in the sense that they had the presence the of mind, mm. you know, to buy land when it was cheap. Can you imagine? No, I can't. <laughs> if we had to buy at today's prices, you know, we'd really be um, in a ditch. So I, I am grateful um, to boards of the past for having the foresight um, to buy land. Uh, the second thing is, you know, when it comes to capacity, this is nothing new. I remember when, when Saddlewood was built. I remember when Ward Highlands was expanded. No sooner did that happen, mm -hmm. those portables didn't leave. They were already, you know, full. And there's so much complaining that goes around in the community of traffic spilling out into the roads. Well, why is the traffic spilling out into the road? If the reason is because these schools are over capacity. You know, and even when the administration and, and different people come together for creative ways to do their zip line or however they're getting them in and out of there, um, it, it, they're still, you know, backing up traffic. You know, we do not have the room on our roads to support the growth that we're experiencing. And, and that is the bottom line. So as we continue to navigate through all of these challenges, this is why the community conversation is so important. Um, there's a reason why Seminole is an A district. And one of the reasons is because they're doing an excellent job partnering with their county, with all entities across their community. And that's how great thing ha things happen. We have been talking around this need for a special, for a shelter to house our special needs citizens for six years. It is time to draft a letter. It's time to show the leadership that I'm used to seeing on this board and ask for the appropriation, ask for the signatures of the affected um, elected entities, and let's get to work together on this. You know, every time our schools have to shut down, it creates a ripple effect across this community. And it is something that other communities have solved over a decade ago. So it's high time that we don't just get out of our silos, that we actually explode them and work together for the better of our community. Because the communities that are doing this are the ones that are navigating this growth the most successfully. Um, so that's where I am with this. I, I'm uh, thinking that board member Cummings, that you're next anyway to, to be up to the bat. <laughs> so take a swing, sir. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> um, I believe it was at the last meeting or last work session. I, I kind of mentioned some of this same thing about um, these schools going to be at capacity. Matter of fact, I, I know I said that Mary Oaks that day had just went over um, a certain number and all of those elementary schools out there in that area beyond a thousand students <clears throat> over capacity. So we, we have to be able to forecast um, that there's going to be exponential growth. It's already there. It's already there and we have to be planning for that. It would, I would hate that as soon as we open the schools, we're stuffing them with portables again. Um, but I also understand uh, we have to be fiscally responsible. We can't just go crazy um, spending. So I, I think the power to be, um, our financial officers and stuff, have, and the past boards have put us in a good place to do this. But it's not just a school board problem. This is a county problem, as Chair Thor just mentioned. And there has to be more collaboration um, and unity of minds when we start dealing with these situations because we're not just dealing with the capacity of the schools we're dealing with the issues of the roads we're dealing with are those roads uh suitable for that type of traffic and all those things that are going into place of of marion county changing so we have to really have some serious conversations we don't we can't dance we can't waltz anymore we have to have the conversations and um with every every governmental body in Marion County because it affects every governmental body in Marion County. Um, tonight, we, we um, in, our, in our discussion items, we approved, I think, four, four, 
four projects that roughly that came on the capital funds, roughly about $5 million of um, replacements of different things. And I, I hear things to, from people all the time saying, you guys got too much money. You guys have more than enough money. No, we don't. No, we don't. We don't have enough money because if we did, we wouldn't, have, we wouldn't be in the situation that we are in trying to maintain these buildings. We wouldn't. I, I looked at some of these um, buildings. Um, they're beyond their life expectancy mm. of their roofs. 20 years, um, we wouldn't have those in our own homes. Um, the warranties are out. So we have been doing a tremendous job. So when I hear people saying that we, we have more money, we've been, we've been doing a tremendous job, as, as the old folk would say, of, of getting the butter from the duck. That's what we've been doing. We've been squeezing every drop of blood from every turnip to, to make sure that these schools were open, that they were safe, and now it's time that we got to pay. We have to put up. We got to put it up. And so I, I don't like to hear when, when people in the community are saying, oh, you guys have enough money, you have more than enough. No, we don't. We wouldn't have gone to the, to the situations of the impact fees and asking for the sales tax and all those types of things if we had enough. We, we have been going so long in a bad situation that uh, now it's things are coming home that we have to deal with. So I'm, 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 I'm glad that we're getting some new schools. I'm glad that we're going to be ready to look at some high schools. Um, but again, we have to be realistic. We say, that, we say in our board statement that we confront reality. Well, reality is we are growing exponentially. Reality is those schools are going to be filled as soon as they, as soon as, as soon as day one. Reality is we have to have a plan in place for that, that growth. We have to have those plans in place. So I'm looking forward to what this board is going to do to put other boards in a good position so that they can make uh, wise choices and, and be able to handle the issues that they're going to deal with in, in their years on the board. But I think we right now are here at this board at the table. We have to make those tough decisions, and we have to have a mind to forecast that people are not moving away from Ocala, American County. They're coming. So when we when we start planning, when Ms. Dobbins and Mr. Knight and Ms. Um, Boston Ellis and all of us are at the table trying to figure it out, we have to come to the table with the mindset that um, we're also preparing for the future. We're preparing for the future because I, I know, I, I know, I, I got a grandkid on the way. They're going to be, they live in that district. They're going to be going to those schools. I got a, one that's in kindergarten. She got 12 years over there. So we need to be preparing for all those things. So yep. those are my comments for tonight. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Board Member Cummings. And um, to, to wrap things up, you know, uh, we've heard and, and spoken uh, a lot um, tonight about a lot of different topics and needs and, and challenges, and I continue to be very confident that uh, while the board members that we have are sitting here with the superintendent that we have and board attorney and board clerk and student board member, that we're going to continue to make good progress, you know, um, every day in, in addressing all of our, our needs and, and challenges. Um, you know, just geographically with Marion County being the size of Rhode Island, anyone can say, sure, well, there's plenty of room up in Fort McCoy, but if you live down in, you know, Marion Oaks, that's uh, probably not a drive that uh, parents are going to want to make or um, that, are, that we could afford to even transport kids to get to those schools. Now, that being said, um, you can either be stuck in traffic in town for 45 minutes or you can take a nice drive up 315 <laughs> and, and be calm when you, you get to school. So, and, and Fort McCoy is a great school. And, and so I think there is opportunity again to be innovative about program placement and things like that to, to try to attract um, some of, of, of the population um, of students you know, to our outlying schools that, that do have capacity. To me, you know, every card's on the table. That's our strength as America is being innovative and creative and thinking big and, and, and visionary. 
And I know together, you know, we can we can do that as as a community. And and speaking of community, uh, my husband and I had the opportunity to go down to Spruce Creek on Saturday night to see the Bellevue High School Performing Arts and, and concert band and show choir and and dancers and and just amazing. I had seen them pre-COVID, so that was a while ago now. Just such a wonderful, wonderful performance. And one of the best things about it is, is that there's a whole group of citizens that get to see our kids in their best light, you know? And uh, hats off to uh, the Spruce Creek residents because they're huge supporters of, of Bellevue High School. And it's just so much fun to see that cross-generational uh, interaction that occurred. It was very uplifting. So that was a great night. And it was also fun to see former student uh, board member uh, uh, Blake here tonight. And he told me that he has decided he's taking his talents to UCF. So he's going to be a knight. He's made his decision. And I didn't get a chance to see a former student board member. I didn't get a chance to ask uh, Divya if she had made her decision yet. So Divya, let us know, please. We're <laughs> on the edge of our seats. <laughs> And I just also wanted to thank my uh, other board members for pushing always um, to make sure that our athletic standards are, are high and, and that the facilities are, are well serviceable. I am ready, board, when you are to um, discuss Attorney Powers' uh, board policy where we make it district-wide for GPA. I think the 2-0 and go is antiquated. I think we're doing a disservice to kids to make them think that with a 2.0 GPA that they're going to get in a school that they say they would like to go to. Uh, the standards are just higher these days. And I think Vanguard High School has proven with great adult support and inspiration that kids rise. You know, you, you set the bar high and you provide the support underneath to push them up and over. And so I am ready to do that. I, I think that so many kids have so much interest in, in sports. And if that's what's going to give them the motivation to try a little harder in school and also realize that if they really want to make it at a four-year university and graduate on time and not be home in December having lost their scholarship of their freshman year, um, that we need to be honest with them about that. So Dr. Gullett, I'd love to get your feedback on this because if the rest of the board is ready, I am born ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. I fully support that. I, I, think, we've, I think we've seen, just as you said so well, um, thanks to our dedicated students and, and staff, uh, teachers, absolutely. And I think we need to raise the bar and I, I think it's time to do that now. Okay. The rest of the board is in consensus, whatever it takes to begin to craft something. Sure. Um, Chair, if, if you um, wouldn't mind, I, I just wanted to say I had an opportunity recently to sit with our athletic directors, and currently board policy gives them the ability to create an athletic code of conduct. And so I know Thursday we have our code of student conduct that's coming for all students, but certainly we I highly recommend if, if we want to help draft that for them, great. But it does have currently in policy for there to be an athletic code of conduct as well. And so they do have the ability to have that higher standard. There isn't such a document that exists just yet. So I, I think that um, whether that's drafted by us or drafted by Dr. Gullett, however that needs to come about, I don't know that it would be looked at the same as a code of student conduct is, because that is something that the full board approves. Uh, but. That was the research because I had very similar sentiments in speaking with them. So I, I, Attorney Powers and I have already talked a little bit about, because we were talking about attendance as well, and, some, and Dr. Gull and I have talked about this, some challenges with the dashboard and what the coaches are actually able to see from attendance and discipline. And so we, we've been having some conversation about that a little more globally as to what policy already would give them ability to do, but we don't currently have anything that's in writing on that. I don't know if Attorney Powers is leaning forward. <laughs> The only thing I would add is that I have had some discussions recently with athletic staff personnel, including Mr. Tucker. Um, They're uh, consistently working on trying to update and upgrade some of their um, procedures and policies. And you're absolutely right that, they're, that they're, uh, the board policy does allow them to have an athletic uh, student code of conduct. And the one thing I would indicate there is that I think that coming from the experts there, coming from the athletic directors, coming from the coaches, coming from um, the district officials in athletics. Um, they are the ones that are in the most unique and best position 
to be able to itemize and lay out what they think will be most helpful to raise the bar without also immediately cutting off access to students who might be on the edge and need this, you know, need the best they can to bring them. Some kids come to school and, and try their best to get at least the 2.0 because of the athletics, you know, and, and might not, um, might have a lot more difficulty getting to the 3.0 and we wouldn't want to just leave them, you know, flapping. So what we need to do is whatever, I mean, they may have suggestions as to what we need to do as to how to achieve that within a reasonable time frame that would um, achieve that reaching for a higher bar without also pulling the rug out from anybody. So um, I would definitely say that, uh, that that would be a worthwhile conversation and uh, that such meetings definitely should, should occur so they can bring those proposals to the board and the board can discuss it more fully. Thank you, Attorney Powers. Dr. Gullett? Yes, yeah, so any policy recommendation does come from staff. So naturally that would come from the staff regardless. And so that's my comment. And the athletic, an athletic code of conduct does not become automatically board policy. That's something that the code of student conduct does by operation of statute. So the athletic student uh, code of student conduct be or becomes um, essentially district procedure. Um, now, it can then be adopted as a board policy within our athletics um, within our athletics policies or added as an entirely new policy. We could essentially, much like we did um, with the, uh, uh, with the civ uh, code of civility, you know, we can both have something that outlines the code of civility within the code of student conduct, which if it is outlined within the code of student conduct, it does, in fact, then become policy. So that might be the uh, most direct way to get there rather than adding a separate policy is to uh, work on that for the future to get together a, and not doesn't necessarily have to be the prolonged future, but to get together that code of athletic student conduct, make that something that they uh, sort of pilot and run out immediately, and then begin working on fleshing out details to make it part of the code of student conduct. Thank you, Attorney Powers. It, it would be my ask for this to have teeth. Uh, again, Vanguard High School has proven over four years is, is what it's taken them to get to this point that it can be done. And if it takes four years to get it done the first time, in my mind, now you now have a blueprint. And so it can happen in a more accelerated fashion, uh, even if it needs to be phased in. But I can say with authority as a former teacher that if you come to school very, very regularly, you do your work, you turn it in, and you are nice, the chances of you having above a 2.0 are very high. And I will also say further that if you are doing better in school, your chances of doing better on the SAT and those standardized tests that we don't have really any control over, the ACT, your chances of doing better on those tests are probably going to be higher too. To me, it's just common sense. Uh, and I hope I'm not wrong about that. So I look forward to further discussion. I look forward to accelerating this and making it happen for, because that's what's best for our kids. We're talking about a student code of conduct, um, um, athletic code of conduct. So um, wouldn't it be feasible that Dr. Gullett would put together a committee or a team to, to flush that out rather than us trying to figure it out and then they bring it back to us? Because I, I do think that it should come up under, at some point, our code of conduct. Um, but I don't want us to put something in place that does disenfranchise kids that are trying hard. Uh, we do have to have a standard, I agree, but there are some kids that are not there and may never get there, but that, but that athletic thing is what keeps them coming to school and um, that keeps them involved in school. So we don't want to move so fast or move so recklessly that we, we uh, forget about that group of kids that are doing their best. Thank you, Board Member Cummings, and I sure uh, appreciate your, your cautions, and I would hope that there isn't anyone sitting up here that wants to move so fast and so recklessly that it, it hurts students. Um, so Dr. Gallaud, I definitely look to you for 
like we've done with other policies, you, re you review them and you bring things forward for us to review and, and follow the, pr the procedures, obviously. But I would like to get this going. That would be my ask. So, Madam Chair, if I may, I, I, so I, Board, I need some clarification. So, um, I think that it's important to sim simply go back to the, the athletic code is procedure. And it, yes, it can come and become part of policy, and the policy allows for that to happen. But I, what I need to know is if the Board wants to move through that process to bring it to policy, or if the Board wants to move forward with policy and we make recommendations. So do we want to move through the, Dr. Livengood oversees athletics. She's already aware and, and is going to facilitate that process with the athletic code. Do we want that process to go forward as a procedure with recommendations to become policy separately, or is that becomes policy? Because One's not required for the other to occur. I just need to have some clarification. My, m let me, if I may, um, my recommendation to the board, based on how policies and procedures work, you all know what I'm going to say, and that is that um, if if we had consensus from athletics, from Dr. Living Goods Department, from everybody else, that this is the code of athletic conduct that we want for our students, if we had that tomorrow. It can be instated as a procedure whenever was chosen, I mean, immediately. Now, that being said, um, during that period of time until either A, we choose to amend the Code of Student Conduct, which there's one coming up very soon that I doubt this would fit well into, uh, we can amend it in the future, um, or we can wait and, do, and add it next year after sort of the test year with it being procedure. Both have teeth. So... If it is, if it becomes procedure at whatever time frame that takes for um, for staff to put together, then under procedure that becomes something that is enforceable. Um, then from there, policy can, if 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 we adopted code of student conduct June first, and on July thirtieth we wanted to amend board policy to include this, we could do exactly that. I just need time to post it. So. Or we could wait until board until a code of student conduct came back around the following year. That's entirely up to the board. Thank you, Attorney Powers. Sure. Thank you again. So, thank you, Chair. Um, so, the way I see this, and we certainly can can discuss it. What my recommendation would be is that I know that Dr. Livingood and Mr. Tucker and the athletic directors are already in the process of working on something. My expectation and potentially of other board members as well would be that that would be in place, ready to go for our student athletes starting in the school year of 24-25. And essentially that every student athlete that makes a team, just like they have to pay their fee to be on that team, as a parent of athletes, you have to pay the fee, just like that occurs, there would almost have to be a sign off that also occurs that these students are also receiving this code of athletic student conduct and that they are agreeing and their family is agreeing that they are going to be abiding by whatever that says. I also would recommend, and again, this is for all of us to discuss here, but that upon that document, whatever that is, is created, that the board then have the opportunity to at least review it. And then if we so say, we think this is good enough that we want to enshrine this in policy, it's not just a procedure, but we think that this should be added into policy, then that would be for the 25-26 school year that we would actually make policy on that. But again, right now, this is, again, Attorney Powers and I went through several of our policies to say it already gives the opportunity in our current policy that our athletic directors and Dr. Gullett's team can create such a document. And it doesn't have to require us to do anything else from the board perspective. But um, I can assure you that just from my conversations, some of the things that I thought were already happening, that I thought we had all this conversation about an athletic attendance policy and all those aren't actually happening. And so that's where a lot of conversation has really developed over the course of the last couple of weeks that attendance alone will be a great stepping stone for us to make sure that the things we thought were happening are actually happening and being put into practice. And that's where I think this athletic code of conduct that will be hopefully occurring in 24-25 school year 
with an ability for those families to sign off when they are paying those fees uh, with the expectation of what those uh, requirements are, I think that might be, in my recommendation, of the, the best step forward to, to ensure that we're getting what we're trying to get out of this, but certainly up for the board conversation. Thank you, Board Member Campbell. Anyone else? I think we're ready. <laughs> you know, what you just said makes perfect sense to me. Um, it's, it's expedient. It is long overdue, in my opinion. Um, you know, we sit up here and, and we talk a lot about uh, increasing student outcomes, um, and this is how you do it. And kids just never cease to, to amaze me in their, in their capabilities, no matter how little they are, the things that they are able to do, given the uh, right supports, as Board Member Cummings was alluding to. You know, it's not like, oh, we just are going to expect this and not give you any help. That's the beauty of, of the Vanguard model, you know, and I've been around long enough to see what it was and what it is, um, and it's great. So those are the things we want to duplicate, celebrate, and make sure the community knows all about. All right. Um, I don't think I could, I don't think I should say anything else. <laughs> I think I, I said what I said, Vice Chair, Cam, Vice Chair Conrad. Good I'm just gonna use those as my comments. <laughs> Good. Um, I just have a couple things. We've had a, a lot of robust conversation here um, towards the end. I just have a, a couple of, things I want to shed light on, and then a couple shout outs. And so um, when I joined the board and I visit schools, the number one um, stressor for administrators seemed to be assessments. And so in my latest visits to schools, uh, that topic has changed, which is a blessing. Um, but I, the biggest complaint is interaction with parents and families. And so I just wanted to share a reminder that educating our children is a team effort and parents are the first educators the best educators for their children and so um, with that statement being made i just ask that we look for ways to support our staff members um, when parents are not respectful in dealing with their students or picking up their students um, or at meetings um, with their students and their educational path. And so we really, as a board member, it was just very disheartening. Um, because when I grew up, if your parent came in uh, for a meeting, it really was a team conversation of how can we help move a student or a child forward. So um, just reflecting on how that occurs and how we can support our staff in dealing with a growing number of disrespectful family members um, as they work with the school to get what they need um, for their child. So that was one, ju just one thing I wanted to bring to light. The other thing I wanted to ask as we look um, ahead at redistricting um, our county, that we make sure to include our administrators in those initial conversations because you go in and you visit with an administrator, they know what students come from, what area, what subdivision, how many students are in each household. They know all of the ins and outs of the children at their school. Um, it, it really is amazing that <laughs> all that they remember right off the top of their head, they can tell you. And so just my ask as we move forward and those conversations continue that, that our administrators at our schools um, have kind of a round table so they can talk about what that's gonna look like for them and how they, think it would be best to proceed. And so um, that's my second ask. For shout outs, I just wanted to give a real quick quick shout out. Um, I visited, when visiting with several staff members, the new subsystem, the ESA, ESS, is going very well. Um, they've been very pleased with it, so I just wanted to give a shout out to that. And I also wanted to give a shout out to our couriers. I pulled up to Bellevue High School today about the same time that one of our couriers did, and I got my bag and lunch for my mentee, and by the time I got my bag and things and got out of the car, the courier had gone inside, dropped off all of their things, was back in the vehicle, and they were pulling out. So, um, you know, our district is so large, and it's such a big job, and so how quickly and efficiently things are delivered around, around our district is impressive. So just a, a, 
a big thank you to that crew and all the work that they do every day to keep us um, moving forward. And lastly, I just wanted to share, we have the Jim Harbin Media Festival, um, which is near and dear to my heart. As a kindergarten teacher, first grade teacher, fourth grade teacher, participated in that program. Um, and it's, it's just such a great opportunity. And so that's coming up this Friday. And um, just want to let you know, if you're available, I'll be here at MTI. And it really is a pleasure and a joy to participate in. So I invite you to come join us. Thank you. That's all I have. All right. Thank you, Vice Chair Conrad. And, and thank you, uh, Board Member James, for leading us off in what turned into a very spirited discussion. And then I ended up giving my comments before Vice Chair Conrad. But, but we all had a lot of en enthusiasm for the topics tonight, as, as we typically do. So thank you again um, for for your great discussion and, and commitment um, to helping every student succeed. And um, before addressing expulsion matters, I wish to acknowledge that board members have received the alternative placement list for students through March 19th, 2024. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and ask for a motion to approve the expulsion of student JD24-198, JD24-226, JD24-227, JD24-228E, and JD24-236 with educational services for the remainder of the 2023-2024 school year and the first, second, and third quarters of the 2024-2025 school year. May I have a motion, please? Motion to approve. Motion by Vice Chair Conrad. Second. Second by uh, Board Member Campbell. Um, is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously, 5-0. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the expulsion of student JD24-232 and JD24-234 with educational services for the remainder of the 2023-2024 school year and the entire 2024-2025 school year. Motion to approve. Motion by Board Member James. Second by Vice Chair Conrad. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously 5-0. We will be addressing for the first time any um, off-air uh, parent um, expulsion requests on Thursday morning at 7 a.m. before our regularly scheduled work session. Therefore, there being no further business, may I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Motion by Board Member James, seconded by Vice Chair Conrad. Um, this meeting, is, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes 5-0. This meeting is adjourned at 7.25 p.m. Thank you.